All Out took place this past weekend from Chicago, Illinois. Controversy aside, you know, the CM Punk shtick, all of that went, you know, away as soon as the pay-per-view started. Because once again, All Elite Wrestling proves that their talent, the people put on the matches, that book the shows, that work behind the cameras, that work behind the scenes, they are quality. They are entertainment, man. And they provided us with a fantastic all-out pay-per-view main evented by the International Championship match in which John Moxley became the brand new International Champion by defeating Orange Cassidy in the main event of that show. And this goes to show you that finally, it seems that AEW, at least this is my viewpoint, finally AEW seems to have picked a mid-card championship that's actually going to be the prominent mid-card title, if you will. And that is the International Championship. Because now you got a guy like John Moxley, full-fledged main eventer, household name. He is now the International Champion. He'll bring a lot more relevance, a lot more importance to the championship, a lot more than Orange Cassidy would have been able to do had he retained his title this past Sunday in Chicago, Illinois. Furthermore, that gives Orange Cassidy the opportunity to once again be that babyface underdog chasing the heel champion. And on top of that, Orange Cassidy gets the face off against the BCC, a full-fledged heel stable who needs a purpose, who needs uh, a direction in my opinion because they've been pretty much going everywhere since their loss to the Golden Elite. And they haven't really been figuring been able to figure out what the BCC is all about after that loss. But now, I mean, I wouldn't mind seeing BCC versus Best Friends and Orange Cassidy in the very near future. I mean, that's that's a, that's a that's a very interesting potential rivalry, potential feud. And again, Moxley and Cassidy, the main event that they that they that they uh, provided the crowd, the audience at home at All Out is just a little bit of the potential of, of, of even better, greater matches that they could give us. And Orange Cassidy has been proving himself for the past, what, almost a year? 30-plus defenses of this title. So this feud, this rivalry for the international championship, it's far from over. I'm, I'm actually excited about the, the, the idea of Moxley as an international champion. And if I'm not mistaken, tonight he has an open challenge, which is a little bit uh, off script for a heel. He's facing AR Fox for the international title, but as long as Orange Cassidy is able to come back, come out and really stake his claim in terms of a rematch against Mockley, I'll be completely fine with that. Now, from the main event, we go to the opening contest of All Out, where Better Than You, Bay Bay, retained their Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles by defeating Dark Order, Alex Reynolds, and John Silver in the opening tag team contest. But what was interesting was what happened right after the match, transitioning into the second match of the show. Because the Ring of Honor World Television Champion, the Samoan Submission Machine, Samoa Joe, came out. And much like he did years ago, back in NXT, back in Brooklyn, this time Samoa Joe didn't shove a uh, quote-unquote extra on NXT TV. MJF played a security guard back in that day. No, he shoved current Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champion and current AEW World Heavyweight Champion Maxwell Jacob Friedman in front of the entire world, in front of the entire arena. And that's going to lead us into tonight because MJF will definitely have something to say about that. MJF, Samoa Joe, one-on-one -on -one for the World Heavyweight Championship. What more can you ask for a prominent feud right now? Of course. Now, granted, Will it happen anytime soon? Will it be for the world title? I don't know. Because AEW has this world uh, title eliminator tournament that leads into Grand Slam. I'm not sure if Samoa Joe is a part of it. If he is, then Samoa Joe might win the whole thing and go on to face MJF for the, Grand, for the World Heavyweight Championship at Grand Slam. So, it's, it's about to get pretty interesting. Again, I'm not... I keep saying this, and I'll keep saying this for as long as I keep watching AEW, which, you know, I'm going to keep watching for quite a while. I do not like Ring of Honor titles or any other titles that aren't AEW on AEW TV, at least not 
regularly, not consistently, maybe once or twice a year, I'm fine with that. There's a reason why you have tag team titles, trios titles, two mid-card titles in AEW. Those are your championships. Stop putting the attention on Ring of Honor tag team titles. Stop putting the attention on Ring of Honor World Television Championships or the Ring of Honor World title as well. The same thing with Monday Night Raw. Dominic Mysterio, he's the NXT North American Champion. I don't like that. That, that title is NXT. But again, that, that's just me. I like to keep things separate. And then when, eventually when they do show up on your show, once, twice, three times at most if it's really working throughout the year, then it makes it matter even more. It makes it even more important. It makes it a bigger deal that it's on TV. It's on AEW TV. If you just, if you just have to show up every other week, every two, three weeks, it just waters down that champion, that championship, and your champion, your championships, the actual, like, AEW TNT, the, the, the international championships, all of it. But again, that's just my opinion. Samoa Joe defeated Shane Taylor to redeem the title. They're going to have a confrontation tonight for sure. Who knows? Tune in later on tonight to TBS to see if that happens. Luchasaurus defeated Darby Allen to retain his TNT championship. And of course, Christian Cage would have you believe that he is co-TNT champion. That's not the case, but he is the mouthpiece. He is the heel. That AEW heel manager for Luchasaurus that he needs. Because Luchasaurus, well, he doesn't really get too much time on the microphone. And... Having Christian Cage by his side, that's a prominent heat magnet. Luchasaurus needs him right now. And as far as I'm concerned, that TNT title, that's a TV championship. That's below the international title, below the world title. Does it have some importance? Of course. But, but you know, it's all a matter of how you uh, portray it on TV. And, you know, as the international championship is at a much better, much higher regard, in my opinion, than the TNT Championship. Miro defeated Powerhouse Hobbs in a fantastic contest. Big, meaty men slapping each other and then in, in a big, meaty men contest. Bam! What more could you want? This was the perfect palate cleanser to any high-flying match, to any technical match, to any spot fest that AEW can bring onto their uh, creative, onto their television. And I'm hoping this feud, this rivalry continues because these two men have chemistry. These two men can go at it with against each other and they will not back off against each other anytime soon. Give these two guys, Miro, Powerhouse Hobbs, a best of seven series matches. Do it on collision for all I care. These two men need to keep going at it against each other and... There's a big reason why it's going to keep going on. And that's because we had the debut of a former WWE superstar. Formerly known as Lana. Uh, CJ Perry is her actual name. The ravishing Russian back in WWE. She's not actually Russian. But she is uh, Miro's real life uh, wife. But the confrontation that they had. Or the interaction rather. That they had on at All Out. When... CJ Perry made tried to make the save for Miro, and then Miro, the Redeemer, this uh, character that he's been betraying on TV ever since he made his debut for All Elite Wrestling, prideful, dominant, uh, just a crusher in every aspect you can think of. Well, he didn't take it too well that his real-life wife, CJ Perry, used to have to explain what she was doing out there in actual storyline purposes. But he didn't take it too well that, that she had to come out and make the save against Powerhouse Hobbs. So just based on that interaction between them two, to me it means Miro and Powerhouse, Powerhouse Hobbs are far from done with each other. Because rest assured, Powerhouse Hobbs will and should Bring that up. Powerhouse Hobbs should come out on Dynamite, on Rampage, on Collision, wherever. Call out Miro and said and say, you needed your wife to come out and save you and take me off of you. 
What do you have to say about that, Miro? And that leads into even more and more fantastic, hard-hitting, big man contest between Miro and Powerhouse Hobbs. Yeah! Sorry, got excited about that. Uh, singles match for the TBS title, Chris Santlander defeated Ruby Soho. And this leaves the outcast uh, in a little bit of state of array. Because Tony Storm, we all, we've all seen what happened in All In. She had some issues with Soraya, brand new AEW Women's World Champion. Ruby Soho, accompanied by the Women's World Champion, was unable to defeat Chris Statlander and become TBS Champion herself. So to me, this means there's going to be a, a little bit of dissension between Ruby Soho, Tony Storm, and Soraya because the, the the power plays, the 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 authority in, within the Outcast has been completely flipped. Now Tony Storm, she was the Women's World Champion. Soraya had just made a return. She just she was pretty much the mouthpiece for the Outcast, the de facto leader. But now she is the Women's World Champion. And Tony Storm, you can bet your ass, is not okay with that. Not completely, at least. She definitely would want to challenge for said Women's World, Champ- World, Women's World Championship. So, that's going to come into play very, very soon. And frankly, if you can't give me Britt Baker, DMD, as Women's World Champion, or chasing the Women's World title, which I still think should be the case, because... That is your biggest star in the women's division for all elite wrestling. If you're not going to give me that, well, dissension within the outcasts, Soraya, Tony Storm, Ruby Soho, going back and forth, all that tension. I mean, that's that, that can make for some entertaining TV, especially since the outcasts have really fallen off from the upwards momentum they had at the beginning of the year. So with that said... Chris Statlander retaining the title absolutely adds on to that story. And hopefully, we'll get some other story for Chris Statlander going. Jade Cargo returning, maybe. I'm, I'm, I, I prefer she not come back and go after the TBS, TBS title. Have her go after the Women's World Championship. Jade Cargo is that big of a star, but I digress. Uh, BCC defeated Eddie Kingston and Katsuyori Shibata. Is that... Is that how you say it? Again, if I'm butchering his name, I'm, I'm sorry. But we all know the history between Castagnoli and, and Eddie Kingston. This played into that. But again, BCC still has little to no direction to, of going anytime soon. So hopefully on tonight's Dynamite, he's able. BCC, along with John Moxley, and the returning Brian Danielson is able to... Uh, how can you say it? Really... Put BCC back uh, in the driver's seat. Challenging, hopefully, the best friends. And then Eddie Kingston can join the best friends. That's going to add even more layers to the story. So again, tag team match. Uh, in my opinion, pretty pretty much run of the mill. Claudio Castagnoli with Ryuta. You can never go wrong with Eddie Kingston or Shibata. Again, ev- everyone involved did a fantastic showing. But for storyline purposes, I had little interest in this match at this moment in time. Uh, Bullet Club Gold defeated FTR and the Young Bucks. That was to be expected. Bullet Club Gold needed the win. Uh, FTR and the Young Bucks, they need that uh, that back and forth dissension between them because the Young Bucks are back in the tag team division. FTR called themselves the best tag team currently in the world, not just AEW. So obviously, Eagles want to pl- come into play when it comes to that, the titles are going to come into play when it comes to that. And much like Miro versus Powerhouse Hobbs, we need more of FTR versus Young Bucks. Tag team matches, tag team title matches on AEW TV. And I think that's a perfect way of getting AEW's momentum back on track if, you, if you're if you able to get these tag teams going at it for the tag titles very, very soon. So the eight-man tag team match, it served its purpose. It was a nice uh, buffer in between Takeshita and Omega and the World and excuse me the International Championship main event. So all things good with AEW right there. Takeshita defeated Kenny Omega by pinfall one on one singles match. Again, you can't go wrong with these two men. 
going at it. And of course, they made the absolute perfect decision. Kenny Omega losing to Takeshita did nothing to hurt Kenny Omega. And it did everything to get Takeshita over. It, get, it did everything to, to really get more heat on Don Callis. As that hated manager who gets a ton of heat in AEW. And once again, Kenny Omega is able to chase the big bad heel group in Callis and Takeshita. Omega is still chasing them so that they can get their comeuppance and he can get their revenge and he can get them to really pay for what they did in terms of betraying him and turning on him. And that and those kinds of stories actually work in professional wrestling and they work so well. And again, Kenny Omega, if he's not going to be a part of the world title picture, which he definitely should be because Kenny Omega versus MJF would definitely be on one of my top priorities when it comes to AEW Creative. If that's not going to be able to happen, then Kenny Omega putting over guys like Takeshita and maybe a few more on the AEW roster, that's a perfect way of using him. Because Kenny Omega, him losing too much doesn't really hurt him. At least not from my point of view. He's Kenny Omega, man. He can lose, lose, lose. The minute he gets in that ring, you can't go wrong. You, 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 can't, you can't sell him short. And Takeshita, well, he needs the wins. He needs the crowd to notice that he's being, quote-unquote, manipulated by Don Callis in getting these wins and, and increasing his stock with AEW. But again, Takeshita and Omega are far from done. One-on-one. -on -one, Future matches to come all up for that. And finally, we had an impromptu match that was announced at Collision. Strap match. Ricky Starks, absolute Ricky Starks, baby. Faced off against Brian Danielson. Which Danielson won. And that final countdown theme. It's a good theme for, a pay for, for Danielson's pay-per-views matches. I don't mind it at all. But basically, Brian Danielson won the match. He beat absolute Ricky Starks in the middle of the ring in his return to AEW in-ring competition. But even though he won, he still fell short. He still wasn't the, 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 the last man standing against absolute Ricky Starks. And that's a storyline. That's a story that's... A, that's that's something that's going to keep going on. And for all intents and purposes, it's the perfect way or one of the perfect ways to get Ricky Starks over the hump. Because as far as I'm concerned, with Punk gone from AEW, Collision is now the absolute Ricky Starks show. And by all means, make Ricky Starks the megastar, the future world champion possibly future face of the company that he is, that he could be. He has a potential for it all. And putting the American Dragon front and center against him, even though Danielson is a part of BCC and their heels, again, AEW with their pseudo feud, pseudo rivalries, that's a little bit um, of an alternative to what WWE does. But again, if it works, it works. And this match, this strap match between Danielson and Starks at All Out in Chicago, it absolutely worked on all cylinders. And I can't wait for the next chapter in this story. So with that said, tune in later on tonight to TBS for another episode of Wednesday Night Dynamite Live. I'm Alexis Correo. This has been Wrestling Talk, and I'll see you next time.